So what I'm going to try and do today is give you a little bit <coughs> of an overview of GDPR, um, really starting from how does it impact um, the general public, what's it mean, and moving into what it actually means for IT, and then moving into what it means for testing. So hopefully we'll make some sense of it when it comes. So while we're waiting, I'll give, give you a little bit of an introduction to me. So I'm, um, I've been in change management now. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> I've been in change management now for 15, 20 years. Uh, started off as a project manager. I've worked across financial services, done a bit of test management, that kind of thing. So I know a little bit about what you guys do. Um, moved then into program management and then moved on into business consultancy. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, the business consultancy thing was a, a natural progression after, after passing the GDPR practitioner. I tended to find that people were starting to ask me to come in and look at little bits of work. And as you might imagine, little bits of work, small enough to really to um, get a little bit of uh, extra cash out of people. So I batched myself a, a business consultant and it kind of went on from there. So let's see if this thing works. So first things first, I am a fraud. I am not a data protection expert, I'm not a GDPR expert. And there are so many people out there professing to be GDPR experts. If you look at what an expert is, an expert is somebody who's been doing something for, I think it's 10,000 hours or something like that. So I doubt anybody's a GDPR expert in real life. Um, so where, where my knowledge comes from is pretty much what happens in business, because I've been working in change for the last 20 years, and what I've learned from the GDPR practitioner, and what I've learned then from applying that within businesses. So I think I'm in a pretty good state in respect of I understand how business works, I understand how regulations work, I understand how regulators work, and as such I'm able to sit in an organisation and I'm not, I'm not missing thing which the organisation hasn't got. So, um, so by now I've been quite good at working out what it is that businesses need to do and then questioning them and working out how that they do it. So I also sort of consider this office set up there good at telling a story. Um, and like it says on there, really, I'm told, this is consultant is uh, full of uh, <coughs> So, and, and, I, and I go with that. I absolutely go with that all the time. My job, if I put it simply, is to walk into a business, ask the business what the problem is, they tell me what the answer is, and I go back to the CEO and tell them what the answer is. And that's how easy my job can be. <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's no rocket science. So, it falls on me to tell you a little bit about GDPR. <coughs> First one up, so I'm going to assume in the room that you know nothing. Uh, I'm not going to tell you everything because that would give away my job, but I'm going to try and give you at least enough so that by the end of what I'm talking about, the other guys will come on and make some sense. So, where did it all start? In World War II, or after World War II, lots of information started to, lots of people started to get worried a little bit more about human rights. Obviously, data privacy or privacy of people became part of that, and that resulted in the uh, EU Directive in 1995, which was to get an EU law or a set of EU laws across Europe where there was some consistency around managing data. Now, I don't know if anybody knows what a directive is or a regulation, but a directive is where the EU turns around to all the member states and says, do this. And the member states then have to put regulations in place in order to do what they're told. That brought across the uh, Data Protection Act in 98, and the whole idea of that was that it would give us some consistency across Europe. But guess what? It failed. Or it failed to a degree. Because what you've got then, guys, you've got 28 different laws across Europe in all the different member states, which were all trying to tell everybody what they did with data protection. And so, for example, a really good example is that the UK could transmit data into Germany, but the Germans wouldn't transmit data out. And that, that gave us a bit of a problem. So that's one of the reasons why GDPR came about. Another reason why GDPR came about is because technology's moved on. We all now walk around with a geolocation device in our pockets, we call it a smartphone, but that wasn't around in 98, really. So things have changed. So we're now looking at data protection across Europe, trying to make, so make sure that we can transmit data across borders and improve the, 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 the environment in Europe. So the question is, is what a lot of people ask is, what will the future hold? So we know what the past has been, what's going to happen with Brexit? The way I explain this, and we've, we've had a little bit of debate <laughs> earlier on, and, we, and people differ with me, and debate is good, but the way I, 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 what I would say about this is, GDPR passed into law 
in March 2016. So it's already on. It becomes enforceable in May 2018, and we come out of Europe in March 2019. So clearly, GDPR has at least a year, isn't it? Let's face it. Um, well, we all know that there's going to be a two year transition arrangement, two year transmission agreement when we, when we do get out of Europe. So you could argue that it's going to be probably three years before we do anything about GDPR. And then my other argument would be that if actually what this thing is coming to do is make it so that we can all trade across Europe in a nice, safe way and cross stage across Europe, you'd argue the case about why on earth we want to come out of it anyway. So I shouldn't worry too much about Brexit. So, what does GDPR mean? Who does it relate to? Well, it relates to living people. Anybody who's alive um, is, is basically covered as part of GDPR. And it's a little, com a little complex in respect of if you're, if you're a European company and you are concerned about data protection, you are covered full stop. Doesn't matter whether or not you've got, um, whether or not the people you're working on, data you've got on is uh, from people outside of Europe or whether they live elsewhere. If you're a European company, GDPR impacts you. If you're not a European company, then you've got to look after EU citizens. Simple as that. So, the likes of Facebook are, and so on, might claim that they're outside of Europe, so not, not part of this. They've got to respond because obviously they've got EU citizens' data. The question a lot of people ask at this point is how can we enforce this if the Americans start doing things wrong? Well, a good example of where enforcement happens, and I think probably most of you will know. Probably about 10, 15 years ago, Microsoft got done for uh, bundling browsers in with Windows, and they basically went through some problems in the EU with enforced laws upon them. The same thing's going to happen here. So you can't get out of it that way either. Oh, nearly forgot. Nearly everybody um, will talk about the fines with GDPR. Um, for me, that's the kind of thing around the maturity of understanding what a GDPR is about. If the only thing you can talk about is the fines, then you've not quite moved on from understanding what GDPR is all about. Yes, the fines are there, significant. They're moving from half a million pounds at the minute, which um, the maximum fine the ICO can currently uh, levy on the part of this, going to 20 million or 4% of gross annual turnover. So, significant. Um, I mean, that would put most businesses out of business if they've got the 4% of gross annual turnover. Not many businesses can afford that. So, you've got to ask yourself the question, how important is that? Well, I think, personally, my view is, is those fines are there to make the board sit up and listen. The board's not listening at the minute with, with, with data protection. We all know that data protection is an IT issue at the minute. It's not going forward with this, and I'll explain why. So, what I want to do is make this thing work. Um, this is where my, my presentation is going to fall apart. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just follow the life of Brian and see how, how GDPR impacts Brian. So this is Brian and he wants to buy some books. And in order to buy some books, he decides he's going to give some of his personal data to Amazon. Now Amazon becomes a data controller, so they're in control of that data. And they've got to inform Brian on everything they're doing with that data. Everything they're legally doing, they've got to have a good legal reason to be dealing with that data in the first place. As part of the thing that, that they're doing in buying those books, in, in providing Brian with those books, is they will in, engage WorldPay or some other company in order to be able to manage the financial transaction. And in this case, WorldPay become a data processor. So the difference between a data controller and a data processor is that the data controller deter determines what they're going to do with the data. A data processor can only do with the data what the data controller tells them. So, if, if you're a data processor, you can't start looking at the data and marketing people on it or anything like that. So, Brian's got some rights, and well, guess what? All of these rights are written in the Data Protection Act. And all organisations have to uphold some data protection principles. If you know anything about data protection, there's current data protection act, you know that principles are in place. They're broadly the same, not a great deal of difference between them all. But the biggest difference is now we have to, the organisations have to prove that they're compliant and that they're managing to those principles. If they can't prove it, that's when they start to get into trouble. That wasn't the case with the DPA. So, supervisory authorities in place across Europe, across England, 
um, the UK, that's the ICO. Their job is to look down within the country, understand what's going off, monitor compliance, and make sure that things are, things are working properly. And as I've just said, the fact that now we have to prove compliance means that they've got something they can do. And they can come in now and start auditing organisations. Um, so they've got the power to audit, they've got the power to interrupt, and they've got the power to start sanctioning organisations as well. So, and the key thing is it doesn't really matter if you're the data controller or the data processor. If you screw up with data protection, the supervisory authority can come to either party and administer and put the administration file on it. And then we've got the EU data, the European Data Protection Board that will look at all of this and make sure that all of the different countries are doing the same kind of thing. So a little bit of background, hopefully, on, on data protection. So I said earlier that we have to manage things we have to do with data in a certain way, and we have to build, we have to basically manage data lawfully. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at what lawful reasons Amazon have got to be dealing with Brian's data. So first of all, the most look after Brian's sorry, this is principles. Sorry. The most look after Brian's data lawfully, and the most tell Brian why they need it and what they believe their interest is to do with that data. Now the reason why that's underlined is because from a testing viewpoint, this will come clear later on as to why that's important. There are a number of other reasons why the things they need to do. So if they're collecting data off Brian, they can only use it for the purpose that they initially set out to use it for. Another key thing for you as, as testers to, to understand. <coughs> you've got the minimization principle, which is you need to limit the amount of data you're collecting off people. Don't start collecting things willy-nilly. If you don't need it for the job, don't, don't collect it. And they must keep my data up to, up to date and, and, and relevant. Um, they shouldn't keep it for any longer than they need it as well. So the minute some of these lawful reasons disappear, they've got to understand what they're going to do with that data. Um, they've got to keep it away from hackers, keep it secure. And then the very last one, the one which is in green, the one which is, in my view, the most important reason, is that now they have to keep records of what data they're collecting, where it's going, who's using it, how long they're keeping it for, and ad infinitum. And that's a massive change for business. And this is why now you start, hopefully you're starting to see that, that business is, is being impacted by this new record. So we'll investigate um, sort of thinking of things now about what that matters to the CTO, to, to the technical people. So if you're to look at things lawfully, it's actually the business or this, what's, this, what decides why they're picking the data up. It's not an IT question, it's a business process question. So the CTO gets a little bit of a green flag on this one, he doesn't need to worry too much about it. Or she, good point. Um, then if they, if they can only collect it for reasons what they've told the person for a, a, a in the first place, yeah, the CTO doesn't need to worry too much about that. Similarly, minimization, don't need to worry too much about that. We're still talking business process at this stage. Keeping data up to date, business process again. Shouldn't hold it for any longer than need to. Business should decide how long data is kept from. It's a lot of reason. They should decide. Now, granted, actually applying that is another thing. You might need IT to, to get involved. Um, keeping it away from hackers, obviously. We're, now, we're, now we start seeing where the CTO needs to get involved. And actually keeping records, they need to, they'll, they'll need to understand where data is kept. So if you start looking at this now, and looking at data protection and GDPR as a, as, a, as, a, a business, as a business issue, you can see why I think it's a much more of a business issue than an IT one. So why, what's lawful about collective data? What are the lawful reasons? Contract. If you have a contract with an organisation, then they can collect data off you, so long as to fulfil that, that contract. If they need your information to fulfil some kind of legal obligation, such as tax and so on, they can collect personal data for that reason. In this case, um, they can also do what they call legitimate interest. So, you might not have a contractual reason or a legal reason, but you might believe that you can collect data off somebody to do something legitimately with as part of your service to them. But if you rely on a legitimate interest, then you've got to tell the data subject that you rely on, on um, legitimate interest, and you can't really get the, you must not be able to get the data from someone else. So if you can't prove, fulfill those two conditions, then you can't really rely on that. 
In Brian's case, we Amazon can't, can't uh, rely on saving his life from it, which is another one of the lawful reasons. Uh, public interest is another lawful reason. And the last one is consent. I say the last one because lots of marketing companies are going out there with the and the this consent issue is a big issue for them. But it's the last thing they should be lying on. So, come back to legitimate interest in a second. Um, we've got eight rights, and this broadly the same, I think, as the old, as the old ones, but Amazon must keep him informed. So, if they're doing something, if they're collecting data for a particular reason, he needs to know why they're collecting it. He needs to know where the data is going, he needs to know what legitimate interest is in place, so that they need to know all this about his rights. He's got the right to access his data, so we all probably know about the subject access request, which currently exists in the DPA. They basically exist in this. And he's got the right to have data corrected, which obviously uh, no organisation would want to have out of their data anyway. Um, there's a new right, right to be forgotten, where he's got the right to have data deleted. This is going to be a massive issue for lots of IT companies because uh, data can be anywhere. Imagine trying to find, if a, if a data subject asks you to delete all the data, imagine trying to try and find that in email addresses and inboxes and shared drives and all that sort of stuff. But it's a genuine right now, and so we've got to be concerned about it. Um, we've got the right to ask to, to restrict processing. And this stands on, and I'm coming back to legitimate interest again. When a company is relying on legitimate interest as, as the way forward, um, they, can, they can actually stop. Oh, sorry, next one, I guess. Um, with, with restrictive processing, is if the data subject believes that the legal reason is gone, they can ask them to stop processing that data. Um, portability is a new right as well. That's allowing, um, business, that's going to a business and asking them to move your data from one place to the next. It's going to be an awkward one, isn't it? That one. Can you imagine if everybody starts asking for that on May 26th? It's not going to be a nice thing to have to deal with. And the right to object is a legitimate interest one. If you're saying that you're legitimate interest to do something and you can't prove it, then the data subject can object to it. And the bottom one, computer says no. If you are relying on automated processing going forward as a business and um, the computer says no, then the data subject, or Brian in this case, has got the right to turn around and ask for a human to make that decision for them. Not a lot of point if you don't add any extra information into that decision making. Process, but it's still there. Right, so what does all this matter to the CTO? Well, the thing is about GDPR is it does introduce this new role called Data Protection Officer. And the, the DPO is, has, has got certain set conditions under which they need to work. Now, not every organisation needs a DPO, there are certain conditions in the community for you to have one. But what I, what I always recommend to organisations is if they're going to put somebody in charge of data protection, follow these guidelines, you're not going to go far wrong. Um, the main things really are that they need to be able to inform the organisation of their obligations as far as data protection is concerned. They need to be able to monitor the compliance within the organisation. They need to be able to advise on data protection impact assessments, so when something's happening, what's the data protection impact on it? And they need to be the point of contact for the, day, for the um, supervisory authority and the data subjects in case of breaches or problems or, or escalations. But to do the job, and this, these are the two key points, to do the job, they must be able to understand the risk of processing operations, so they need to understand the organisation and what are the risks in the organisation. And they also need to be independent and need to be no conflict of interest in place. So clearly, if you start to look at those two things, you can see the CTO is just not the right person for this job. No, nobody in a technical man, in, in a technical uh, guy, should really be looking at this because there's masses of conflict of interest. If you're responsible for looking at the firewalls and the data security, how can you look back and monitor it and give an honest opinion to your board and say everything's fine and we're all hunky dory? You can't. So, so clearly, we can't have a CTO in that position. Equally. We can't have a chief marketing officer in that position either because marketing is a big thing around data protection and so on. So you've got to be very, very careful about where you put this technical data protection person in your business. My view is it's no longer a technical problem. It's now a business problem. Data protection, it was a technical problem because there wasn't that thing in place which said you now have to prove it. Now we're going to prove it. It's firmly in the world's lap to solve these problems. 
So, what I want to do now is just wrap up by covering off one of the questions which is probably on your minds as a tester, and hopefully referring back to some of the other slides. Um, and one, certainly one question I've been asked, which is, what about, what does data protection, what does GDPR mean for us? So if we look at what are the contractual reasons behind holding, holding the data, we look at the problem of what data can we use to test with, well, we've no longer got a contractual reason to use Brian's data for testing, because it's not part of the contract that we test, the, test with his data. So, and we, so clearly we can't use that anymore. It's not going to save his life if we test, use his data to test with it. So clearly we can't rely on that one either. So that means we can only really rely on two things. Either legitimate interest, which, if you remember, we said we had to basically have a more of a reason than needed, or we can rely on consent. Now the thing is about consent is you've got to ask them outright, can we use your data for this? It can't be hidden in anything, it's going to be clear. So you wouldn't want to do that. You wouldn't want to be asking everybody, can we use your, can we use your data in the database? So you're left with one thing, really, which is this legitimate interest to a degree. Now, the thing about legitimate interest is, like I said earlier, we've got to inform the data subjects what our legitimate interests are when we collect the data from them. How many people think that as part of the joining the contract with, with, an, with a, an individual, how many people think that in that contract or in the, in the documentation of those people we say, oh, by the way, we're going to start using data for testing? Clearly, nobody. So, if we haven't already told the data subject that we're going to start using that data for testing, then you've got a problem because you can't rely on legitimate interest because they don't know you're going to do it. You're not told them in the first place. So you're really left with one other option, which is get rid of your personal data. Make that data not personal data anymore. And that means anonymizing your test data. And so I'm not saying there's only one option. I, what I am saying is there's only one practical option, which is to anonymize. The other option, you could probably do from now, as long as at some point you put, start to put into your contracts that you're going to use the, the data to process in. You could do that. No reason why you couldn't. But it's impractical. You're not going to be able to be sure that somebody hasn't objected to it. So you not. So you have to maintain the data set with people who have objected to it. So clearly, the clear answer is anonymization. <coughs>